Hey, John here. Let's talk about buses a little bit. Earlier, I defined these as a collection of related signals. All right, that's a pretty general term. And the use of the word bus is a pretty general thing. But uh, we can still communicate a lot of detail if we really want to. Buses come in different flavors. Let's say we have a memory. Now, whether it's a single chip or a whole board or something like that doesn't really matter. What do we know about it, right? Well, we know that we have to select or inform the memory what address we want to interact with. Maybe we want to read the memory, okay? Or maybe we want to write to the memory. Okay, and when we do any of these things, we need to exchange data with it, okay? So what happens? Very often, if you actually go buy a real piece of memory, it will have data signals, right? Now, it only drew one. We can put a line through it like this. Let's say this is a big memory and it has 32 bits of data. You do this. There's 32 data lines, you would say. And we would argue that it's obvious, or should be obvious to anyone familiar with the art, that the, the, the data line, this line here that represents 32 physical wires or signals, are going to be numbered from 0 to 31. You know, unless I say different kind of a thing when I draw a schematic, or any designer or an engineer would say, if I don't label these, you assume this. Same thing happens with address lines, right? Let's say I have a 32 bits of, uh, of signals that I use to convey the address for this uh, transaction that I want to commit, right? So let's say I, I'm going to, again, assume they will be numbered 0 to 31, okay? Now, read and write, again, if you're familiar with this whole thing, uh, if they're not labeled and or if you're familiar with what's going on, these are single wires very often, okay? Uh, you would never leave a single line like this without any indication at all that it represents a bus, okay? that no, That's just nobody does that. You put a slash in a number, or you could even leave the number off if, if you wrote address o dot dot 31 over here, or you use a different color, or you draw it with a thicker line, you know, that's visual clue. You, there's always a clue, okay, in any kind of documentation. So in this, as I've drawn it here, this is incredibly standard and in, in, like the default way that everyone does this. The, a signal called right is a single bit. A single called read is a single bit. This signal called address is a collection of 32 bits worth of information. There'd be 32 physical wires here, okay? Now, usually there's also another one called enable. And what this one's for, uh, this is where reality sets in. All right, I'm going to put it on here because we'll see this maybe in a minute. Uh, once you deal with reality, you deal with power consumption and other such things and, you know, cost of the circuitry and stuff like that. This enable uh, line, this enable signal is used to tell the memory to disregard anything and everything on every other one of these signals. All right. This is a very useful signal when you're building a system that has many memories in it. Right? If you have a lot of memory, you might have many memory cards or many memory chips, and you might only want to enable one at a time. Okay, This allows you to save energy because the thing will go into shutdown mode and stuff like that. This, like I said, this is, is you know the difference between some you know, phony baloney, uh, uh, virtual, basic uh, understanding and reality. All right, These collective, collect these together, we can call this a control bus. Okay? This down here, these 31 bits, oftentimes is referred to as an address bus. Why? These are certainly related. <laughs> all right, all 32 bits of an address, they're related. These signals go together because they have to do with controlling the memory. That's a control bus. What, what do you suppose this thing is going to be called? That's a data bus. Okay. Now, we can collect all three of these together if we want to, right? They call this a memory bus.
So what's the point of all this? The point is, this is a general term. It requires context to understand what somebody's talking about. You don't just talk about the bus, okay? You talk about the data bus, you're talking about these three, these 32 lines, I should say. If we're talking about, you know, a control bus, we might not know which one because there could be other control buses in here. Somebody, you know, if we're only talking about memory and you say control bus to someone, they know you're talking about the memory control bus. If you're talking about it in a massive complex thing that shows many memories and I.O. devices and everything else, this, you might have to call this the memory control bus. All right. Again, you just give enough context so somebody knows what you're talking about. Here's your address bus. Memory bus is the collection of all of the above. All right. So let's, you know, apply this to something. OK, so you just saw that we had a memory. So let's say, you know, inside here is all the circuitry needed for a memory. All right. It has an address bus, a data bus and a control bus. OK, great. Let's say we have a CPU. I'm going to just draw it like this. We'll just assume whatever's inside here are all the gates and circuits and stuff necessary to be a CPU, right? What do you do to hook the CPU to the memory? Well, you draw it like this. What's this? This is the memory bus. Okay, this is a block diagram, all right? We don't want to have to show every little stinking thing, right? We're going to just say, look, I have a CPU, and I'm going to hook it up to some memory by using a memory bus, okay? Now, this diagram is what we call a von Neumann machine. Okay, and why do I know that? Why? Because the CPU has one bus connecting to one memory. All right. Now this is in stark contrast. I'll change the color. Let's go to a a, a darker. No, we'll go to green. Okay, here we go. Green one. <laughs> that almost looks green anyway, but maybe it'll look different. I don't know. Here's another kind of a way of doing the, accomplishing the similar kind of a task. Let's say I have a CPU that looks like this. I have a memory bus that goes like that, and I have another one. Why not? I can have more gates, more wires and stuff like this. What what's that all about? Okay. This is what we call a Harvard architecture. Now why they use the word ar architecture here when they really mean organization, I don't know. But this if you Google it, that's what this is, okay? And this is gonna be the von Neumann architecture up there. Now, what's the difference between these two? Well, obviously, this one has two memories, that one has one. Uh, but it's a little more subtle than that. Uh, this memory, specifically, all right, is uh, intended to hold uh, data, okay? And the memory over here is intended specifically to hold instructions. I'll abbreviate the word like this, okay? What are these things? These are both memory buses. And I'll abbreviate that, too. Okay, so in a Harvard architecture, you have two memory buses. One of the memory holds the data for your program, and another memory holds the instructions for your program. Well, a von Neumann architecture, you have a CPU, you have a single shared memory bus. And the memory over here, let's go back to our blue pen, holds all of your data and your instructions. All right. Now, what are the implications of all this? That's the point. Von Neumann, one CPU, one memory, everything's in this memory. That means that the instruction range here, or the address range, I'm sorry, the address range, okay? You know, maybe it's uh, zero through, uh, you know, four gig or something like that. Okay. Great. Given an address in a von Neumann machine, it maps into one single unified address space. Okay. Everything's in that one address space. So if I give you an address of an instruction, an address of a data, those two have different addresses, 
okay? This is unified, okay? This is not. If I have data stored in, in this memory at address zero, okay? Let's say I've got something down here at address zero. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's some variable called I in this memory. I could also have something in address zero in this memory over here. Maybe this is a load instruction. They could both have address zeros, okay? Now, this can get complicated, right? So the address space of the instructions goes from zero to n here, and the address of the, of the data in the address space of the data memory also goes from zero to n, okay? The point is the instructions on a Harvard machine differentiate between when they're talking to the instruction memory versus when they're talking to the data memory out of necessity, okay? And a programmer in a machine like this has to keep in mind whether or not they're dealing with addresses that refer to instruction versus the data, okay? This can get complicated and confusing if you're not ready and prepared and used to it, okay? So that's my point here. Um, this one up here, no matter what you do, everything's in the same uh, address space. And, uh, you know, any address in any register could be used for anything whatsoever. It's also possible uh, uh, in this kind of a design where you can write a program that's easy to modify itself because you can actually write programs that generate instructions and poke them in memory and then tell the CPU to execute them, all treating it in the same way. Instructions, data, they're all treated the same way in this machine. Easy to write viruses, okay? This one down here, not so much the same. If you wrote a program and you said, oh, I want to treat this data, you know, create an array of bytes and poke values in there that represents executable instructions, you cannot tell the CPU CPU to just go execute them. You have to copy them from there over to here and then tell it to execute them over here. All right. So on, on a Harvard architecture machine, you know, a commonly known one, if you're into uh, hardware tinkering, the Arduino is a Harvard architecture machine. Okay. And uh, there are some kind of hybrids and things get blurry. But if you actually look at the assembly language of an Arduino program, you, you have to tell it which is which. Okay, so let's wrap this up with a couple of observations here. Harvard architecture, two memory buses. Now, if both of these memory buses are identical and the memories are identical, and by that I mean they have the same number of bits and they go at the same speed, okay, then it's easily observable that the Harvard architecture can move twice as much data per unit of time as the von Neumann architecture can, okay? Okay. This is like the never-ending argument over whether you should use one versus the other, okay? Otherwise, uh, you know, I don't know, it has some impact. It, in fact, it, it impacts the instruction set uh, downright noticeably because, uh, like, for example, if you look at the uh, uh, machine instructions on an Arduino, there are some that refer to the, the uh, instruction address space and other ones that re uh, refer to the data address space, and the programmer needs to be cognizant of it, right? Uh, that's not so true on CPUs that use the von Neumann architecture. Now, uh, like I said before, there's some machines that kind of blur these lines. For example, you can have a von Neumann architecture machine that has multiple memory buses on it, okay? But from the programmer's perspective, the CPU sees all those memory buses as all concatenated together. So, for example, the machine, you know, a block diagram might look like this. Maybe you'd have another memory down here. And then this address space is just one big thing, right? And there might be another memory bus over here. And more data. Dot, 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 instructions. Can be spread across both of these memories, all right? And this is, uh, you, you do see this in certain PCs. You'll see uh, um, like multiple banks of memory and they'll be separately connected to the CPU for double speed and things like that. In order to gain the same kind of arguments you get in the uh, Harvard, while at the same time retaining the value of just having one single giant address space and the simplicity, of how that uh, uh, manifests itself when you're writing your code, all right? 
Thanks for watching. See you next time.